So joining us is Hiroki Yoshida, the founder of Meti DX, a brilliant digital innovation unit in the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. We have Pak Agung Hikmat, a digital transformation advisor to the minister in the Ministry of Education and Culture in Indonesia. Agus Sudarmadi, the Information Technology Director, the Directorate General of Customs and Excise of Indonesia. Pak Fajar Muharandi, Senior Solution Engineer from our partners at Cloudera. And thank you to Cloudera for making this government digital services session possible. But now we are going to turn to our speaker, our international speaker who has come beaming in from Tokyo live. Please welcome to this Zoom conversation, Mr. Hiroki Yoshida, the founder of Meti DX Japan. Hiroki, take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me today. So my name is Hiroki, uh, yeah, Deputy Director of IT Project Office uh, of METI in Japan. So I want to show you my presentation slides now. Uh, wait a minute. So, so now uh, I show you my slides. So, so my title is Create Digital Infrastructure Together. So, so First, uh, I will talk about our organization. So METI is dealing with Japanese economic policies. Uh, I belong to Commerce and the Information Bureau, which covers the IT industry. I'm in charge of uh, digital government policies here. So we founded METI DX office in July uh, 2018 to transform government administrations. Uh, we try to change the way of IT development, mindset of government offices, and organization itself for digital era. So today, uh, I want to talk about five learnings from COVID-19. The first one is quick development, deployment of digital service to deliver support in emergency. The second is utilize private services for public services to reach citizens. The third one is uh, open data standardization for civic tech, private companies, and local governments. The fourth is combination of open data and open source is the key for next generation government. The last is create GovTech ecosystem for better public services. I will talk one by one. Oh, sorry. So first, uh, we have been building data services in the layer structure because components of the same function should be uh, shared among government agencies. Uh, this structure is quick deployment of digital services and the cost reduction. For example, uh, GB's ID is an authentication uh, component. This function is needed for all digital applications. So in that case, uh, so we, we connect this with the other components via APIs. Each layer should be designed to be connected through APIs to realize flexible systems. The second, uh, we want, if we want to reach mass customers quickly, uh, we should collaborate with private services. For example, uh, we collaborated with Line, uh, which is one of the most largest messaging services in Japan, to provide the information of government support for businesses. And uh, another example is that if we collaborate with a uh, venture called Medifrat, to provide medical consultation remotely through mobiles in COVID-19. So this is a kind of digital public-private partnership model in emergency. And the third is open data standardization. If the government agencies open up data uh, to the public in the standardized form, private sector can utilize it. For example, uh, METI collected the data of private companies' free or discounted services and uh, opened it in the standardized form. After that, Civic Tech Group, Call for Japan, uh, created the search engine for uh, that data. Also, we opened up the data of government supports. 
and the Yahoo Japan also created such services for customers. And the Tokyo Metropolitan Government also created a such service, adding its own support into it. The fourth is that combination of open data and uh, open source leads quick service de development. Tokyo Metropolitan Government opened up its source code of website for COVID-19 on GitHub, and all prefectures copied the source and uh, created their own site. So this is an innovation for expansion of this digital public services. Another good point of open source is that we can improve uh, our system continuously and anyone can contribute to the better services. Many information services about COVID-19 emerged from civic tech guys in Japan. And the last and foremost is that we need to create a GovTech ecosystem with companies and citizens because governments are typically scarce of IT capabilities, uh, but if the government should tackle with uh, complex issues, we need to collaborate with the stakeholders who have proper capabilities. To do so, uh, we need to create a community of GovTech. And uh, my last message is uh, hack the government together. So government is not perfect. We need to admit that and create the services together with companies and the citizens. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hiroki. And I'm sure that people have lots of questions to be putting to you in the comments as well. While we are waiting for Agon to join us, we are now going to go to our next presentation, which is from Agus Sudamadi, the Information Technology Director at the Directorate General of Customs and Excise in the Government of Indonesia. Good morning, Pak Agus. Good morning, Aaron. It is a pleasure Hi, to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so for having me in this uh, very nice uh, webinar. And um, for those who are uh, interested, please look at the agenda for the other sessions ongoing at the same time, I should point out. But now I'm going to leave it with you to take this presentation forward and I'll check in and speak okay. with you straight after that. Please take it okay. away. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Agus Darmadi from Customs, Indonesian Customs. Uh, customs institution in the world generally have four functions, actually. Yeah. Uh, first one is a state collector revenue, trade facilitation, industrial assistance, and community protector. Quite complicated and uh, contradictory functions, actually, because they're always uh, faced with the two opposing sides. The first side is uh, how we should uh, guarantee yeah, the services related to the customs clearance process. Our stakeholders need quick response with the minimum officer interventions. In other side, on the other hand, as a border protection agency, it is required uh, to guard national borders from the entry and access of dangerous goods or prohibited goods, which implies that the need for controls and maintenance, uh, maximum inspection from uh, officers. Uh, to face this dilemma, uh, in order to maximize the effectiveness of the, our customs duty, we believe that yeah, customs institutions must intelligently and appropriately place in the position, not only as a part of the government agency and need to check everything, but also as a part of the logistic supply chains that need speed up, speed up everything. To do that, we need assistance in the form of technology, in order to uh, run the duty effectively. In the context of the use of communication and information technology, uh, Indonesian Customs has had uh, quite a fairly long history. We started uh, automation uh, since 1990. Yeah. Uh, at, at national level, in, a lot of uh, initiatives also are released by Customs yeah, using the ICT uh, information communication technology. Uh, for example, national single window right now is uh, already in place. Yeah, serve uh, 
other government agency to connect with the logistic supply chain is uh, previously uh, initiative by Indonesian customs authorized economic operator risk management uh, for administration process uh, and everything is also uh, uh, proposed and initiated by Indonesian customs currently we are in the way of on implementing a chesa 4.0 we call it the chesa 4.0 as a backbone of our customs uh, ict system which is uh, can be used also uh, as a national forecast strategy in the sector uh, revenue sector and law enforcement uh, activities related to logistics also function as a national logistic supply chain uh, enabler in terms of using the latest technology uh, our system has also begun to enter the use of uh, the computer vision yeah, uh, this year for monitoring purposes as well as the big data and iot for the trade and financial analysis at present uh, our ict system has expanded its use include more than 40,000 active users yeah. uh, 400 main uh, 84 uh, business uh, processes with more than 4,000 menus yeah and almost reach uh, 350,000 document per day which our document is which require uh, an immediate decision making process and zero tolerance for unexpected downtime uh, right now also uh, our system at isa utilization reached more than 5 million api hit and uh, almost 1 uh, 4 million jobs done automatically every day that's why due to the sake of the national interest all transaction related to the customs clearance activities must be carried out online, real time, agile, simple, transparent, and adaptive to the need of users. In terms of data exchange and collaboration with other systems, CESA, uh, our custom system, has been connected with many institutions, not only domestically, yeah, but also internationally, not only with business entities. Uh, system but also connected with uh, other uh, law enforcement agency from other countries to make the collaboration program running smoothly we do we have to simplify our business process first and administration uh, administration activities we have introduced the single doc, doc, uh, document program and also the program that we call it your export big company my import which means that export document are from uh, neighboring or other countries will be pre-populated to import to become import document in Indonesia in order to increase the compliance and transparency and also to speed up the process using the ICT. We can see a lot of uh, several countries that already uh, are connected to us. Uh, Singapore yeah, are still in progress. Yeah, we do uh, some uh, program on that also with the Republic of China and other uh, countries. In the law enforcement agency, we already connected and collaborated with the Bank Indonesia, uh, uh, KPK also, yeah, uh, uh, and other agencies, or also the business uh, uh, business uh, institutions. In terms of collaborations and integrating with the domestic supply chains, uh, the involvement of the chase function function is an enabler, almost end to end. So we uh, we come uh, we are exist in every uh, movement of the goods yeah since the arrival of uh, starting from the arrival of goods or processing licensing administration that uh, connected with other government agency tax collection that uh, connected with the digitex and uh, also the uh, geo revenue uh, payment system and also being an enabler for industrial manufacturing and trade process processes the next questions yeah, ask how does Indonesian custom deal with this uh, situation using the digital transformation? Meaning, the role of uh, ICT in our institution is not longer as a supporter, but also as a neighbor, become an enabler, even in some cases become a driver for business process when needed. We, uh, from the IT team, uh, make a lot of uh, proposal to the uh, our uh, colleague from the business process uh, and the regulation uh, directorate uh, to change the, the regulations, uh, to change the administration process uh, following the uh, current state of the technology in information communication technology. For that, it cannot be denied that the developing modern workplaces 
business applications, state of the art of ICT, such as the use of big data and artificial intelligence are become important for us. To ensure the success of this digital transformation, therefore important aspect uh, from our perspective. Firstly, uh, it, uh, when we use the ICT, it always be a disruptive uh, situation. So firstly, empowering employees and engaging and engaging a stakeholders through digital flat, platform. Optimize, optim the second, optimizing business process operation using the latest technology. And most importantly, because ICT has uh, become a driver, business process transformation must follow the use of ICT that was developed in the custom. This is the main point, uh, our digital transformation in the customs institution, Indonesian customs institution. Going forward, um, starting in 2018, the CESA system is uh, developed not only by following the latest technology, but also, but also simplification, simplification of document. From hundreds of the customs document, we uh, pick up uh, to be, uh, we call it the uh, program to be a single document yeah, through a single core ICT system and also the use of artificial intelligence and uh, big data. We also believe that in the digital era, there is no single ICT system that can do operation stand alone without collaborate, collaborating and integration. Yeah. Given the contradiction uh, between the implementation of our function, yeah, where custom official cannot inspect good and document 100% uh, in one side, the implementation of risk management through the development of smart customs and exercise, exercise based on the big data meaning that we need another information another data from other system both from the private sector and also uh, from the government sector that's why uh, this situation has made innovation custom and exercise institution right now become a data driven institution so we rely a lot with the data and collaboration and integration as a consequence bringing custom service and uh, supervision closer to the stakeholders must be done through a mobile-based application system also. Uh, this slide show how DG, uh, uh, Indonesian customs adapt and minimize the technological gaps in this era uh, of digital transformation. Our strategy is utilize, utilizing big data platform in order to conduct analysis for decision making and as a support for the insight for uh, service and control. We can, uh, through this uh, uh, approach, yeah, we can provide uh, 24 uh, seven services, uh, 20 hours, seven days services yeah, along the year. Yeah. In the context of uh, data interchange and collaboration, we right now also use the API technology with other entities and adapt it with other technologies uh, in order to success blockchain yeah, with the uh, IBM uh, blockchain, it is, uh, has uh, greatly assisted us, yeah, CESA, in improving the quality and integrity of the data uh, available at our uh, institution. Currently, uh, CESA API has become a backbone API for collaboration between system in the customs and other uh, logistic uh, platforms. For internal pur pur purposes, yeah, to uh, for the employee, yeah, bring the work closer to the employee. Yeah, we develop the dig dig digital uh, working space and flexible working space, where customs employee can do work from home, yeah, from the office anywhere and anytime. The issue of, uh, for doing that, we have to develop trust among employees. The trust must be built and common vision and mission will produce of uh, will produce more productive and efficient and effective outcome because right now in uh, our uh, institution 70 uh, 70 percent of our uh, work squad already work from home and work from home base uh, only 30 percent work at the office right now yeah, facing the new normal uh, for the external, yeah, uh, currently we initiating the national, we call it the national, ecos, uh, national logistic ecosystem or NLA. Yeah. 
uh, based on the uh, presidential instructions uh, uh, number 5, 2020. NLA uh, initiated the by customs is a platform that connecting and collaborating all ICT system related to the log logistic uh, supply chain end to end. This collaborative involve uh, action involve all log logistical uh, actors in the private sector as well as uh, other government agency and uh, institution. We believe that the digital transformation cannot be done be done alone. For that. Openness to share and connect to each other become imperative. It is a must. The strategy facing the digital uh, era and the transformation, digital transformation gap, uh, in our perspectives, is we have to collaborate, we have to integrate, when we have to work together. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that great and insightful presentation. I'm sure people have a lot of questions that they will wish to ask you when we go to the panel session. And now we are going to the advisor, to the Minister for Education on Digital Technology, Agun Hikmat. Good morning, Agun. Are you joining us? Have you beamed in? Did you make it? All right. So uh, I'm yours. I'm ready to discuss with you guys and happy to re really join this. Uh, panel with the uh, awesome panelists and happy to share what I've learned so far about uh, digital service, be it in my tenure uh, when I was in the president's office and currently I'm yeah providing some advisory uh, to the Ministry of Education in Indonesia. Fantastic and your video is now on. So um, what I want to ask about first, so you, you before you were in this role, yes, you're advisor to the president on, on digital government and you're a real advocate for government digital services uh, as a whole. And one of the um, one of the projects that you led was Satu Data Indonesia, One Data Indonesia. Perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about what that is and, and what the objectives are behind that. Yeah, so it starts with a discourse of um, having an open data ecosystem within uh, the government, um, very much uh, inspired by the movement of open government at that time. Um, and we really see a lot of merit in opening the data to, to the, the wider public um, until we realize that apparently the way we produce and disseminate data is not there yet. Um, so we think that um, it is not just about opening the data that matters, but also how to improve the quality and the integrity of the data itself, because it will address a lot of um, a, a lot of rooms uh, within the policy um, making domains. Um, we believe it is the right step uh, for us to increase the quality of our uh, policy making processes. So yeah, Satu Data then uh, extended from just talking about uh, providing the right format of data in uh, the open data um, platform, but also how we um, revisiting uh, the governance within uh, ministries, across ministries on really producing quality data. You also were an advocate of open data as well. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what's the value of opening up this data across Indonesia? I mean, there, there are a lot of value in it. I mean, um, the obvious one is about accountability of how the government works, uh, of how um, policy and programs been executed. Uh, but accountability is just one thing. Um, open data should also increase the 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 event efficiency or the effectiveness of a policy that uh, we are executing, right? So yeah, it, it is good, uh, of course, to get feedback from from public on uh, whether we're uh, allocating uh, fund or distributing money accountably. But uh, open data gives us more than that. Uh, it also gives us feedback on maybe there are better ways in in executing policies. And um, why, why is e-government so important in general to this administration and to this president? Yeah, um, I think it is also because the, the, the president himself uh, see, sees the merit of uh, going uh, digital. 
um, especially when he's faced with the um, context of running the country, Indonesia as a country, right? Uh, we are such a huge country. Um, uh, a lot of um, islands, we are an archipelago, and then um, we also have this um, law on regional autonomy. It makes things a bit more complex in terms of allocating resources um, and also managing um, managing funding and also managing the uh, state apparatus. Uh, technically, of course, technology can help uh, with that. So I think uh, it is very logical for the president to start um, the e-government project by um, improving the back end and improving the back end of the government, the machinery of the government. Although we, we start also to see uh, um, the development of digital services that face the public uh, themselves. So yeah, I think that's, that's my thought on, on the e-government priorities. And how has COVID-19 demonstrated the need for digital services, perhaps particularly in education, for instance? Mm. Yeah, I think um, COVID-19 really um, and makes us realize the importance of investing in digital um, service capability, the digital delivery capability. Uh, it really shows um, across countries, across regions, those who has been in, have been investing in digital capabilities. What I mean by investing in digital capabilities is um, building the, or, the right organization, uh, hiring the right talent, those who's going to that path seems to anticipate COVID-19 uh, much better. Um, we, we can see the uh, evidence in Singapore and Korea. Um, They're tackling this COVID-19 uh, by using tech uh, and show um, the, the, the public on what's the take up rate on the, 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 the patients. Uh, and it, it also shows uh, in the regional uh, within Indonesia. Uh, so we see um, there are states, uh, there are regions, there are cities that, that handles this better because they've invested uh, properly in digital service capability. And um, what kind of tool, technology or technique most excites you in, in uh, government at the moment? Well, um, I'm, 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 I'm very much a technology enthusiast, um, but um, really what um, makes me enthused uh, when seeing technology uh, development is not the technology itself, but how technology is being used. Um, yeah, of course, there, there are a lot of buzzwords on um, blockchains or AI, um, but really how to really contextualize the use of it is the the, the discourse that we want to have. For example, I'm, I'm quite interested in the example in Singapore uh, where I met the Ministry of Health and then they said that in running uh, the policy of uh, implying tax on sugar, it's difficult. Uh, of course, there, there are a lot of tension within the industries, but apparently they, they, they are taking the, the way of implementing technology, uh, which also becomes an alternative of um, promoting the policy of health. They deploy um, wristband that uh, works to track your, your, your steps and then do a national challenge and they see some improvement in uh, wider public health, which is very interesting. So it is not uh, always policy that can match that kind of uh, change, but also technology itself can be an instrument of the policy making processes. And give us a teaser of the future. What sort of things are you talking about now in the Ministry of Education? What, what sort of exciting technologies, innovations, ideas are you discussing in that ministry? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's um, what I mentioned before. As, is the centerpiece of our discussion day to day within the ministry, meaning uh, we are really looking at the intervention of um, education uh, areas that can be really improved by technology. Um, so if we think about technology, it works as uh, in the context of mass customization uh, and then automation. Um, then we try to match make it with uh, what's the wicked problem within education. For example, uh, an interesting case is uh, 
we know for sure Indonesia is getting better in providing access to uh, to students. Uh, we, we are building schools, we are giving them access. But the question is whether uh, students are really learning within the schools, within the classrooms. Hmm. Um, that happens that they are not, uh, according to our PISA score, they, they, they are improving marginally. And then we learn that um, to really learn, apparently uh, you need to to, to assess the students and then you need to provide uh, learning at the right level. So teacher got to teach at the right level, uh, which means there, there, there are gonna be a lot of customization on how teacher uh, would create their lesson plan. So those kind of areas uh, that technology uh, definitely can help, uh, mass customization in uh, teaching, teaching and lesson plan, and then also source uh, materials for students to learn. And um, yeah, I think there'll be a lot more uh, room where technology can play and increase education quality. That's fantastic. And there's a lot for us to look out for and look forward to as well. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Agung. No worries, I'm happy to discuss with you guys. Fantastic, take care. And now coming up, we have a presentation uh, and a, we have a panel discussion with Fajar Muharandi, the Senior Solution Engineer at Cloudera. Good morning, Fajar. Good morning, Joshua. So you're going to talk with us about data and government digital services. Take it away. All right. I think, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, very uh, refreshing and interesting to see uh, the previous panelists uh, sharing about their vision, their innovation, and how they uh, cope with this kind of situation that we have now. Uh, and also interesting to see how uh, Pak Agung, uh, Agus, and uh, Yoshida-san also talk about the, uh, how important it is to have uh, digitalization across uh, government services. And I think in Cloudera, we, uh, we believe that big data is actually the side effect of digitalization uh, because when we start digitalizing a lot of things, then the data will only get bigger. Right? We first start to digitalize uh, transactions and then the data will get bigger. We start to digitalize uh, shopping, right? And then we get more data out of that. And now we start to digitalize human to machine interaction or machine to machine interaction. Then we have IoT and the data gets bigger. And in Cloudera, what we're doing is we are a company who helps our clients building a platform to store, collect, and analyze a huge amount of data. And throughout our journey, uh, helping our clients, uh, we can see that, especially in the government sectors, we can see that uh, there are several stages to a government data initiative, right? And uh, we can see that like the stage zero, I would say, or stage one, is that uh, government starting to realize uh, that data is important, right? So they just realize data is important, but uh, they haven't done anything. But they start talking about it. They start uh, drafting regulations around it, uh, but they haven't done anything. And then the stage, uh, the next stage of it is the stage two. Uh, they uh, begin to uh, collect the data. Right? So after they realize that data is important, then they start uh, collecting the data. And we can see that uh, a few years ago, I will say like five years ago, we can see that, that a lot of governments uh, were struggling because when they realize that data is important and then they start uh, collecting the data, uh, they realize that most of the data that they have is not in digital format. Right? So now they come to the stage three, right? they realize that uh, they need to make a clear cutoff, meaning that we can have all the data in uh, non-digital format, in hard copy format, but moving forward, let's upgrade our operational system so that it can capture the data in digital format because it makes it easier for them to process and analyze the data if they are capturing the data directly in digital format. So that's stage three. However, what we are seeing is that 
a lot of governments at that stage uh, were still trying or struggling to start collecting their previous data, which is still in hard copy format. That's why I think about four or five years ago, we can see that a lot of uh, initiative in the governments around OCR, optical character recognition, how they can extract textual information from their hard copies of documents. Uh, what they need to realize is that even though they manage to OCR uh, those documents, it's only getting the textual data, but there's a lot of works, manual work that needs to be done, like mapping the metadata, making, making the data meaningful, annotating the data. So it's still a lot of manual work. So it is important that uh, a lot of government's agencies at the time then starting to realize that they need to make a clear cutoff. So from now and forward, we'll start collecting the data in digital format. So that's the importance of digitalization in relation to how we can make use of the data. And then the stage four is that once we collect the data in digital format, then we realize that we need to make sense of the data by correlating the data. We need to integrate the data because we have data coming from multiple sources. Now it is important for us to create the linkage between the data so that we can answer uh, bigger questions, right? So that's step stage number four. And then the next stage after stage number four is that after we manage to create the linkage and correlate the data, uh, what's we're seeing it's probably in the past one or two years is that uh, government agencies now starting to open up their curated data. So we are hearing a lot of open data initiative. What is interesting with this stage five, uh, which I think where most of our government agencies is at, uh, we begin to realize that even though we are collecting data for our internal purpose, right, to do our functions, to deliver the services to the public. At one point, we realized that the data that we are collecting can be useful if we are opening up the data for the public, for the private sectors, and even for other government agencies. And take, for example, in this COVID-19 situation, let's say we have Department of Public Transport, right, and probably Jakarta provincial governments or other provincial governments, they are collecting data about people's movement, people's mobility, commute pattern. It is important for them to analyze the data, to do transportation planning. However, the Department of Public Health Service might get benefit of the data as well, because by looking at the same data set of people's movement, people's commute pattern, we can predict how the disease will spread, right? And it's not only about sharing the data between government agencies. Uh, private sectors can also benefit. For example, uh, commuter line, if they want to impose uh, restrictions on how many people uh, should be in a single car in a train line, they can come up with numbers, 40 people, 50 people, but it is better if that number is derived based on the information coming from Department of Workforce. If we can know that these are a million people coming to Jakarta every day, right? And they are commuting from neighboring cities using public transport such as commuter line, then they should be able to derive the numbers, right? If we limit the people commuting to Jakarta in alternating fashion or deciding which one should be coming to the office and which one can work from home, we can come up with numbers and we can corroborate with the commuter line service. Then we can come up with numbers, or this is the target numbers that we should impose the restriction on in order to avoid the long queue. Because what happens is that if we're not talking to each other and we're not sharing the data among uh, agencies, among private sectors, is that we just come up with numbers, right? And that numbers is causing a long queue on the train station. 
that is something that that I think is important and it's happening now in stage five where where uh, a lot of government institutions now uh, realizing that even though they are the one who's collecting the data, they are the one who's investing on the technology to collect the data, but eventually it's for the benefit of the people for them to open up the data to the other government agencies and also to the private sectors, right? At the end of the day, it's the benefit of the taxpayers. And the stage uh, number six is that uh, then uh, we realize uh, the benefit of collecting more and more data, right? collecting data in a longer retention period, because we want to see the trends. We collect data in a historical manner. We can see the trends between this year and past years. And after we manage to collect the data in a historical manner, then the stage seven is we try to predict something out of the data. Right? So once we have years worth of data, then of course the next logical step is to make use of the historical data, then try to predict something out of the data. So this is something that we are seeing that a lot of uh, government agency in the world starting to do that. In Indonesia also we're beginning to do that, but I would say that mostly we're still at stage five and stage six in Indonesia, and I'm hoping that we will we'll get better soon. And the reason why I think that uh, in Indonesia especially, we will start accelerating in the stage is because uh, the current state of the technology is allowing that, the open source uh, movement, the uh, movement to embrace uh, the cloud infrastructure, because cloud is the fuel for innovation. And it is more important than ever, especially for the government agencies in Indonesia now to pick the right technology that will allow them to be flexible in the future, pick the right technology that will allow them to be uh, uh, more agile in picking the deployment patterns, whether it is on-premise, whether it is on cloud, or even to move between cloud providers. So it is something that in Cordera we have been uh, putting much thoughts on. So yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's always about making good use of the data and giving back, giving benefit to the taxpayers. That's what we're thinking. Fantastic, thank you so much for that in conversation presentation about data and government digital services. We are now going to have a panel session and also a Q&A session as well. So I'm going to look in the Q&A box and I'm sure there are some questions. Yes, we've got a few questions that I will be putting to people during this. But let's have all of the panelists now, I hope, on screen. And I'm going to start with Hiroki from Japan by asking you, how important has data and the organization of data been to enabling MetiDX to create digital services? Uh, yeah, so I think standardized data is very important. So as Fajr said, uh, I think standardized data can be shared among uh, government agencies and uh, each divisions. And uh, may maybe we can uh, maximize the value of data uh, by doing so. So for example, if you can get some uh, application data from one business, one business. And uh, if you can utilize this data in another division, uh, maybe it will be useful for that business entity. So uh, like that. So I think if we can share the data more among the agencies, uh, it will be beneficial for the users, businesses. So I think that point is very important for the government. And, yeah. and you're using data in quite interesting ways, for instance, to support machine learning, for instance, in government services. I wonder if I could ask you to give some examples of how the Japanese government is using AI and machine learning in the delivery of government digital services. Yeah, actually, uh, there are a few projects uh, utilizing AI in Japanese government. Uh, however, uh, one of our POCs 
is that uh, we try to analyze the speech documents of the ministers and uh, try to create uh, uh, some samples of the speeches for another situation uh, for ministers. So, so this kind of uh, yeah, usage of data is, uh, yeah, it, it will help uh, our yeah, daily based uh, yeah, operations and uh, also our daily, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, so, so it is very useful for us uh, if we can utilize uh, AI. How, however, uh, if we try to utilize AI, in that case, the data should be uh, standardized and uh, it should be uh, easy to analyze. So I think that is very important. Fantastic. And I'm going to turn to Pak Agus now. Uh, so, Pak Agus, how important has data been to you in, in designing and creating systems within the Directorate General of Customs and Excise? It's very important. We can do uh, customs uh, business without uh, data information because, as uh, I mentioned before, that we have uh, two uh, functions then opposite each other. In one side, for the revenue collection, for example, uh, there is an, uh, a need to do a full examination, full checking. In other, uh, uh, other side, for the industrial assistance and trade facilitation, our stakeholders, they want uh, a less interface from the, the customer. So, using the data, we have to do a risk management, a management process. So we can, uh, based on the data, based on the information, we can uh, do our business with the risk management. Yeah. For example, right now we have uh, three cluster for our customers. We call it the uh, authorized economic operator, meaning that we can, we're not doing everything when the good came, uh, come to uh, do, we, we're not doing examinations, physical examination or documentation examinations. Yeah when they, their goods uh, come or out from uh, uh, to Indonesia. The second one is we call the priority channel. Yeah, there's a, lo a lot of facilities for them. And uh, for the people that we not trust based on the, our data, on our information, we do 100% checking or something like that. So data is very important for us. It's like uh, uh, we cannot uh, do our business without the data and information. Thank you. Hmm. And Pak Fajr, let, let's turn to you now to talk about um, advice you'd have to government in how they should be using data uh, and how they could simplify or, or create data sets and make sure that they're able to build services with that data. Yeah, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, important first to uh, start collecting the data in digital format because that's the only way then you can uh, make use of the data easily. Uh, I'm not saying that the data not in digital format is not useful. It is useful. It's just that you need extra effort for you to do that. And one thing that I felt uh, a lot of governments and especially in, in Indonesia is still struggling is that even though now uh, we are good in collecting data in digital format, uh, we are good in starting to analyze the data, we are good in starting to open up our curated data, but the data exchange between uh, the government agency is still a bit lacking. I know that we have the uh, One Data Initiative, which is important, and I think it's one of the great things to ever happen in the uh, word of open data initiative in Indonesia, but it could be better in terms of sharing uh, a more recent data instead of data that has been summarized, that has been uh, pre uh, polished, pre processed. So, because uh, we realize that in private sectors, right, uh, the raw data and looking into the data at its purest form, right? It's actually a lot more interesting and you can get a lot of answers out of it because one principle that we need to realize in analyzing the data and trying to get answers of the data is that uh, we don't know what we don't know, right? When you have the questions 
on top of the data, meaning that you know what you want to ask, but there's a lot of things that you don't even know that you need to ask. But when you look into the data and then you realize something, there is insight in the data. So it's, it is important that, that we need to start uh, building this uh, data exchange environment better. That's what I think. Thank you very much. And um, to note that you're not currently sharing your screen, you're sharing a photograph of yourself. Oh, so if you wish sorry. to share your screen, that, that, would, be, that would be rather pleasant. Um, but actually, we are going to ask a question. I'm going to put it to Hiroki first, but please do keep sharing your, your screen. Let's turn to things that we're excited about. What, what tool, technique, technology most excites you at the moment? What innovations are most interesting to you, Hiroki? So actually, I'm so excited about open source community in Japan. So uh, during COVID-19, uh, many civic tech people are uh, creating uh, digital services for the people. So, and uh, I think, so to Tokyo Metropolitan uh, website is also created uh, by civic tech group called, uh, called for Japan. And uh, this group has a lot of civic takers uh, uh, who are working for IT companies usually. However, they are uh, gathering online and they created their uh, new site for, the provide, for providing information of COVID-19. So this kind of situation hasn't happened ever uh, in Japan, however, I think uh, we can feel uh, the power of uh, people uh, by utilizing IT in this situation. So I was so excited about that, yeah. So, so it's about bringing together a community to design and build services. Yes, yes. And um, if you could improve one thing tomorrow, about government digital services in Japan, what, what would they be? Or perhaps in technology in general, what would it be? Uh, I think uh, it's not about technology, but I think the mindset of the government officers. I think I sh I should, we should change the mindset of government officers because uh, many government officers are in silos of each uh, government agency. So, in that case, they cannot share the data together with other agencies' people. So I think that prevents the maximizing the utilization of the data. So, so I think we need to know uh, the power of data, shared, shared data power. So I think mm -hmm. that point is very important. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Pak Fajar now. We, we have a question for you that's come in through the Q&A box at the bottom. And if others want to ask questions, please put them into that Q&A box. Based on your experience related to collecting and management of data in terms of public transport data, is it better to work with data owned by the government or data owned by the private sector? sector is there a difference between the data or should you work with all of the data that you have available <laughs> it is an interesting question so by right the government should have a better data because the government has the authority to collect the data however we do realize that the data that the government has uh, uh, it's mainly coming from the public transport and if we want to have a better view of our public uh, transportation, then we also need to get information from the transportation providers in the private sector. So I think it's better to have both if we want to have the holistic view. But if you ask me which one is better, I would say that the government should have a better data sets because uh, they have the authority to collect and curate the data and it is actually uh, uh, the responsibility uh, to, to share what is being integrated because if you're looking on the data coming from private sectors, they don't have the holistic view of the public transport. They only have the data which they collect related to the service that they are providing. Right? So that's, it is important for, for the lawmakers especially uh, 
uh, if they want to uh, make some important decision based on data, then we look into both data sets coming from private and also coming from the data that they collect on their own. And let's talk about what's exciting you at the moment. What innovations have caught your eye? What tool, technique or technology is particularly inspirational to you? I think, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, talk previously, uh, what I think is really fueling the innovation uh, in the area of technology, big data and digitalization is how we can embrace the cloud. And uh, the reason why I'm so excited is because uh, nowadays uh, we can see that a lot of companies, uh, local companies in Indonesia, government agencies now starting to embrace the cloud. Uh, the reason why I am excited personally is because uh, a lot of occasions where we in Korea are trying to do something with our clients, it is actually uh, being uh, hindered by, hindered by the ability to execute faster, right? You wanna build something and then you need to wait for months for the hardware to arise, for you to start building something on top of it. But now I think with the emergence of cloud infrastructure, it is making us easier to innovate and fail fast, right? And this is also the reason why in Cloudera, we are trying to build our platform to be able to be deployed both on premise and on cloud on private cloud as well, because we want to give the flexibility to our clients. If they want to build something on the cloud, they can use our platform. If they want to bring it back to on-premise, then they can use the same platform. So this is the reason why I think uh, it is exciting. And this is also something that I think will be one of the uh, fuel for the innovation moving forward. And Pak Agus, let's turn to you now. What's exciting you at the moment? What Techniques, tools, technologies, innovations, ideas have caught your eye and are particularly inspiring you and the Director General of Customs and Excise as well. Yeah. For us, it's the, the most exciting is uh, face recognition, image, the detection, right. and the big data because it helps us a lot. Yeah. Used to be we have to check uh, the goods come and go from Indonesia physically. Right now, we can sit down. Uh, we can see from the image and from the uh, uh, image citation, something like that, and we can do a decision-making process uh, more faster. Yeah. The second one is the big data. It also help a lot. Uh, help us a lot yeah, to make a decision uh, uh, faster. Yeah. And um, let me follow on. So if you could change one thing tomorrow, what mm. would it be? There is no uh, spirit of ego sectoral. Yeah, ego sectoral silo mindset or something like <laughs> that. Because right now, without collaboration and integration, we can do nothing. We can do everything uh, by ourselves. So we have to collaborate uh, together. We need a mindset change. Mindset okay. Change, change. And let, let's finish off by putting to all the, the participants about this new normal that we're starting to see. Uh, what, what has COVID-19 done for, for your digital services? How has it made you rethink the way that you run as an agency, that your employees engage with one another and that you deliver your services? What, what difference has COVID-19 made uh, to you? And Pak Agus, let's, let's start with you on that. Yeah, uh, we changed our culture. Yeah? Used to be uh, uh, when we call it the term of examination, we, our mindset is physical examination. So right now, we not only uh, think about the physical, but we can use uh, tools, uh, te technology, to do also the examination. Yeah. So the physical appearance as a customs officer used to be needed, but right now, using the technology, our stakeholders still uh, see that, oh, there's a customs officer there, because we, uh, they, uh, they feel that uh, customs are already uh, replaced by the system, something like that. So uh, it tends. Right now, uh, our uh, workforce is 90% work at home. Mm. 90%. And, and what difference does that make when they're, they're working from home? How does that change the way that the organization... Yeah, works? there's a new culture, coordination. Actually. Yeah, so, uh, the, so we have to uh, ready uh, every time, uh, every day. Yeah, even in the weekdays, uh, start a weekend, sometimes we... Have a meeting or something like that. 
that's a really funny. Fakfaja, let, let's put the same question to you. The new normal. So how have you seen that operations, business organizations have changed during COVID-19 and what changes do you think you would anticipate coming about uh, as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, well, what we're seeing in Cloudera, especially because we are the uh, technology providers to enable uh, a lot of things like collecting data, processing data, analyzing data, we're seeing that there's been a surge in uh, the use of our technology uh, to be able to analyze uh, data sets related to uh, this uh, COVID-19 situations, right? So I think uh, and it is also our honor, I would say, that we are helping uh, behind the scene, right, to help uh, governments and uh, private sectors uh, across the world uh, in order for them to survive and I think do better in this kind of situation. And uh, what's interesting uh, to me also in the data space, uh, now we are also looking into a change of mindset. Uh, a change of mindset here is very interesting because now we begin to realize that a lot of professions in the area of data professionals, like data scientists, data engineer, apparently it is something that can be done remotely. So the boundaries between uh, the data professionals uh, locally and also overseas is now starting to diminish because now a lot of uh, local companies now begin to realize that, uh, hey, now I can engage a uh, data engineer from out of the country, right? And I can engage data engineer from local people. And what's the difference, right? Because uh, they are also not coming physically to the office and it is becoming more interesting and I can see that uh, uh, the local data professional is also starting to up the game because they realize that the competition is coming. A lot of people are realizing the changing in this, uh, uh, the way they work. And uh, of course, I think relating back to uh, what we do in Cloudera as a company, right, the ability for us to uh, run analysis uh, anywhere uh, you wanna run, it's, it's also very important. So that's, I think, uh, something that we need to adapt. Uh, Fantastic. And, and Hiroki, then over to you, but we've only got one more minute of this session. So very quickly, if you could choose one thing about the, the next normal, obviously you've given us a whole presentation on COVID-19, but one thing about the next normal, new normal that you think is already changing in government, what would it be? Collaboration with uh, citizens and their companies is very important for us and uh, it will be new normal for us. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to all of you. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. And thank you, of course, Cloudera for making this session, as pos this session possible as well and supporting us. And um, if you wish to contact Faja and Cloudera team, uh, please look them up and do get in touch with them on LinkedIn or through GovInsider if you wish as well.